All right. So we're going to just go through five mock questions. We're going to keep this really short tonight. And we'll go through five mock questions and Katie and I will explain them to you. And Katie is going to get started with question one. All righty, you guys. So Dana just turned 17 and she has had her driver's permit for a year now. She's so excited to get her actual license so she can drive her new car. That was a gift from her father. She's counting down the days until her 17th birthday so she can take her driver's license exam. Her big day came and she was so excited that she passed. Dana reaching the driver's test standards to obtain her license is an example of which of the following? A, criterion reference assessment, B, curriculum-based assessment, C, ecological assessment, and D, in the moment criteria assessment. Your correct answer is a criterion reference assessment. So when you have a criterion reference assessment, this is used for measuring performance around a set of developmental tests or a commonly accepted criteria for specific levels, right? So in this scenario, she reached the criteria on her driver's license test in order to obtain her license, right? So that's a criterion she had to reach. Um, it's not B because B is a curriculum-based assessment. And this is when we're looking at data that represent performance levels on a specific test or lesson. So think weekly or daily. This is often used in educational settings like, <clears throat> excuse me, a teacher probing for uh, or assessing a student's skills. C would be your ecological assessment. And that's when we gather basic information about the client and the, where the client lives and works, right? Because we're, ecological is our AK for environmental assessment. And in the moment, criteria assessment is actually a made up term. So that would not be the option here. All right, guys. So let's look at question two. Question two says, Joan, a BCBA, was conducting an FA assessment on her client, Lenny, to manipulate environmental variables in order to find the function of Lenny's tantruming behaviors. As Lenny's tantruming behaviors can become aggressive, Joan took important safety procedures, including wearing protective equipment. As the FA assessment continued, the behavior got much worse and Joan was not prepared for the behaviors to become very dangerous. And she continued on with the assessment. In the current scenario, what did Joan do wrong? A, she did not rule out medical considerations. B, she should not have done an FA if the behaviors were too severe. C, she should have termination criteria for her FA assessment. And D, she did not implement the control condition. Guys, this is a really hard topic. Also, um, part of a lot of this is like more expanded upon in the fifth edition. In the fourth edition, they did not go into the depth that they are going into in the fifth edition for essentially functional analysis. So a lot of you guys are asking Katie and I, what's the difference between the fourth and the fifth? Some of this stuff is new. So if you've been studying for the fourth, you do need to go back and you need to look at all of the um, FAs in a lot more detail than you did before. So, cause they're on the task list. So here, the um, let's look at the questions here. Let's, let's take them one at a time. She didn't rule out medical considerations. Now there's nothing in here talking about medical considerations. So that's not going to be an answer. She should not have done the FA if the behaviors were too severe. There is a type of FA we do with severe behaviors, which is a latency FA, which is when we stop immediately, right when the behavior starts to occur. Um, so you, you can conduct and you do have to conduct a functional analysis if you don't know the function of behavior, right? We, if you, with behaviors that are really dangerous and severe, um, sometimes use that BACB where you intervene without doing an FA just to immediately get a handle on the situation. But if you truly don't know what's maintaining it, you can't even do that, right? Because you can't write a behavior plan if you truly don't know the function of the behavior. Um, and then I'm going to, so the answer is C here, but I'm going to talk about D first just so we can rule out all the other answers before we talk about the correct one. So she did not implement the control condition. Again, there's nothing referencing that here. What you do need to know is that when you do a functional analysis, you are reinforcing problem behaviors, right? And essentially, you are essentially provoking problem behaviors. So there is always a risk of behaviors escalating and becoming dangerous. You have to be prepared and know what to do in that situation and also when to stop, right? At some point you do stop. You don't continue to do the FA 
when things are dangerous. So here it says that um, Joan was not prepared for the behaviors to become dangerous, that she continued the assessment even when they were dangerous. At that point, you don't continue the assessment. So before you conduct an FA, you have to decide, you know, if this happens, I'm gonna stop, especially if you think the behaviors could be dangerous. All right, so does that, hopefully that makes sense to for everyone. Does anyone have any questions about that? No, we're good? Okay, so let's move on to question three. Based on the stimulus preference assessment you've conducted with Kylon, you now have many presumed reinforcers such as Doritos and cookies. You place a Dorito and a cookie on the table. Kylon is looking at the cookie with wide eyes that show excitement. When he completes his academic task correctly, you present him with the cookie. You then observe to record if complying with academic tasks requests increase in the future. If the next time you're working on an academic task completion, he seems less interested in the cookie, you present the Dorito. This procedure exemplifies A, multiple schedule reinforcer assessment, B, in the moment reinforcer analysis, C, concurrent schedule reinforcer assessment, or D, progressive ratio reinforcer assessment. A lot of people giving it a go over here. Good job, you guys. Got some mixed answers though, so we will discuss. Yeah, I got some mixed answers as well. I'm really glad, guys, that we're going over this and that you're all here. This, like I said, is really hard. And it is a lot of this, right, Katie, is new on the fifth edition. Yeah, this is all new to the fifth edition. Um, so essentially, your fourth edition gave you the basis of your FAs and your FBAs, right? And then what the fifth edition is requiring is that we dive in a little deeper and get a little more specific. And that this is what it kind of looks like. All right, so let's talk about it. So your best answer here is something called in the moment reinforcer analysis, right? And an in the moment reinforcer analysis is used for making reinforcement decisions in the moment. So that's your buzzword, right? And in the moment based on your client's responses or how the stimulus is affecting, showing an effect on your client. So such as, is your client laughing? Is he smiling? Is he frowning? So as we can see in this scenario, his reaction to the Dorito and the cookie, well, specifically the cookie, he was showing excitement, right? But these were the two items that he actually showed they had an effect on him. So in that moment, that's where the practitioner is taking that data to understand that it's going to either be the cookie or the Dorito. And later in the scenario, it states, well, if he's not that excited about the cookie anymore, next you would present the Dorito. So that's why in the moment you're making that game time decision. Okay, and it's not going to be our multiple schedule reinforcer assessment because that's specifically identifying which contingency is most effective as a reinforcer when there's two or more component schedules of reinforcement available for one behavior. And that's not what we're seeing here. Um, what are our other options? Concurrent schedules when we're pitting two reinforcers against each other. So the scenario would be more specific to state and stating that the cookie and the Dorito were being compared, which one has a stronger effect. But she's essentially saying they both have this effect on him, a positive effect. And if one is a little less, then she knows she'll present the other one. So she's not necessarily putting them against each other. And a progressive ratio reinforcer assessment is when we um, gradually increase the response requirements for the reinforcer. Right, so answer two questions, here's the teddy bear. Answer four questions, here's the teddy bear. We're gradually increasing that response requirement until we reach a ratio strain. Once we reach that ratio strain, that's when we know the client is no longer gonna work any harder for that re specific reinforcer. So we get to determine how hard that person's gonna work for that reinforcer. And in this scenario, we're not necessarily increasing any of the over, um, task requirements here. All right, perfect guys. Let's go on to question four. All right, we have Georgia, a BCBA, is conducting an FBA with her client, Miguel. Georgia is running the escape condition, which she terminates after a single instance of Miguel's target behavior following the delivery of the reinforcer being assessed. This was conducted within the frame of one or two minutes in order to evaluate the potential antecedents and consequences that contribute to the target behavior. 
Georgia takes probe data and presents this information using an equal interval graph. Which type of FBA is Georgia using? Latency-based FA, precursor FA, trial-based FA, and FBA. All right, I actually see a lot of you are getting this right, so I'm super excited about this. Um, how about you, Katie? A couple of mixed answers on this then. Yeah, all right, so I'm gonna first go through what all of these things are, because chances are if you were studying fourth, you really didn't deep dive into this. In the fourth edition, and we keep pointing out, as Katie pointed out, you know, you did need to learn about what a function analysis is. You needed to learn what the phases were, but we didn't really go into the types of function analysis, analyses. Now, I think it's analyses, right, on the fifth edition, but you do need to know that, or fourth edition, you do need to know that for the fifth. So latency-based FA, that is something you're going to use when a behavior is dangerous, such as aggression or self-injurious. Um, this is essentially when you, as soon as the behavior occurs, then you stop the control condition and you don't repeat it, right? So this is going to, excuse me, you stop the assessment and you don't repeat it. Not the, um, so that is what's gonna be a latency-based FA. And you're gonna do that because we don't want to provoke um, repetitively dangerous behaviors that are dangerous. So essentially you're just doing the bare minimum that's necessary to determine the function of a problem behavior. And you wouldn't use that unless a behavior is dangerous because it gives you the least amount of information about the function of a behavior, but it should be enough to intervene if a behavior is dangerous or again, self-injurious. And then there's a precursor FA. A precursor FA is going to be looking at essentially the things, the signals that a person's giving off or things that are happening just before behavior occurs. So if you, so like, for example, today, like, you know, and this is just like a, um, there was, I wasn't doing a functional analysis, but I was doing an observation and I saw some warning signs that the child was just about to have a meltdown. And I said to the therapist, I think it's a really good time to give the kid a break, right? Because I started to see him like clenching his fist and looking up in the air. And those are things that I've observed happen right before the tantrum tends to occur. And so, you know, when that's really what a precursor FA is looking at, it's looking at what's happening right before a problem behavior occurs in order to find signals and warnings that a behavior is about to occur. Then you have a trial-based FA. A trial-based FA, which is the answer to the question here. Now, again, this was not part of the, the fourth, but traditionally the phases in a functional analysis must be 20 minutes long. They should be taking place for 20 minutes you're going to repeat the trials. You're going to be repeating um, the, the set basis, basically whatever phase you're in. You're going to keep repeating it within those 20 minutes to get multiple examples um, of the function to establish functional control, right? So trial-based FAs are different. So rather than doing one 20 minute long kind of session for the attention condition or the play condition or the escape condition, you're going to then alternate. So they're only going to be one or two minutes long and then you're gonna switch conditions and then you're gonna keep switching conditions back and forth. So you're never gonna have one 20 minute chunk with one condition. You're gonna have shorter chunks of the condition being repeated. And then FBAs that hasn't changed, fortunately. We have our direct FBAs and our indirect FBAs. For right? indirect FBAs, we're talking to other people in order to make a hypothesis about the function of behavior. And then there's the direct FBAs where we're observing the behavior and trying to see what happened before and after the behavior. And there we have our descriptive and our, um, our descriptive or narrative FBAs, right? Where we either write things down or we have our checklist where we just check off the function of the behavior. So there's a lot in that. Um, so I'm really glad you guys are here and you get to see all this new stuff. Your answer is D, duration-based preference assessment. And the reason why that's your answer is because it's rather simple, right? The, the writing's on the wall with this one. She used a timer to track the amount of time her student engages with the various toys and games. So essentially, if you're trying to figure out how long they're engaging with the, the toys or the games, that's your duration based. And the reason why it's not multiple schedule preference assessment, because we know that that's not an actual behavior analytic term, it would be multiple schedule reinforcer assessment, and our multiple stimulus without replacement would be a preference assessment, but this would be when multiple stimuli um, is out in an array and the client can choose. Once the client chooses an item, the item's removed and the remaining items are rearranged. 
That's not what this scenario is exemplifying. And then lastly, successive reference assessment is when one item is presented at a time. So this we should be familiar with from the fourth edition. However, duration-based preference assessment might not be as familiar to 